What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 30 of the Blue River Bow Hunting Podcast. Uh, I'm Brett Morris, your host, and uh, got a pretty uh, cool episode lined up this week with uh, John Shoshol of uh, Appalachian Custom Calls. He makes some some badass turkey calls that I just used this spring. But uh, what's up, Jonathan? What's going on, buddy? Hey, Brett. How are you tonight? Good, man. You know, it's it's turkey season. It's uh, I didn't put an episode out this past week, so kind of took the, the week off from, from doing everything, including work, and went and chased some turkeys and uh, got my butt whooped in the process, but that's nothing new to me on turkey hunting. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've all been there as hunters. I mean, uh, it don't matter. You're the most seasoned hunter. We all, we all get our butts whooped. Yeah, like you said, yeah. you know, it, it's it's been a weird season, especially here where I'm at. Uh, Birds were not vocal at all. Uh, I heard a couple of gobble on the roost um, the first morning, and that was about it. And it, it was so weird because I was in Michigan, which is north of where I live. I was north about four and a half hours, and them birds gobbled so much. I don't think they – I mean, they couldn't breathe. They were just gobbling so much on the limb. Well, you know, a lot of folks I've talked to this year from uh, Florida to Michigan – it's been an off year here in East Tennessee. It's not, you know, been a normal year. We experienced a lot of uh, cold weather throughout season. Uh, our birds have really just started gobbling in the last two weeks, and they're still not the most vocal I've ever heard. I mean, yeah, you know, the population isn't what it has been. And uh, the birds haven't really vocalized. Even the hens, I've not heard a lot of hen vocalizations this spring. And that was the one, and that's, crazy you know usually this time of the year you know things are happening especially with with the hens and everything i mean That's, you know especially being vocal in the morning but i did experience that in in michigan they they were the hens were very vocal especially right as soon as they pitched down in the field i there was probably 10 or 15 hens out in this field and they was all going to town and, and i started calling on them and I got four of them's attention. The the one hen just wouldn't shut up. I mean, every time she would answer, I would just go back and forth with her, just messing with her, you know. And and in the process of me and her barking back and forth between one another, we had them toms all fired up. All four of them would gobble at the same time. I was like, oh, wow, I'm shook up. You know, they're probably about 200 yards-ish, and they just strutted and gobbled all the way to us to about 70 yards and then had some, some whitetail issues, which I'm going to get those guys on the show here coming up. Uh, maybe next week and kind of talk about our weekend as a whole it was it was fun definitely to hunt uh, turkeys in a state that I've never turkey hunted before and it was so weird you know me and you were talking before we hit record about timber birds and field birds right. up in Michigan where I was at it's just wide open and these birds would be in the middle of nowhere there is no you know how hard putting a, a stalk on a turkey is anyway you're not going to really want to do that they were out in the middle of like big big 300 acre fields so they were like extremely kind of hard to get to pay attention to and i kind of mentioned i'm like well let's do some reaping you know let's get a fan out you know if they're out there let's try that at least and uh i didn't realize that it was illegal in michigan so we definitely didn't do that <laughs> <laughs> definitely you know it, it is, uh, as far as I know, still legal here in Tennessee. I have reaped a few in the past, but, you know, we see a lot of field birds. But for me this year, the majority of birds that we have killed and uh, that I've helped call in and seen come to the gun have been in the timber this year. We've uh, we've experienced a couple of field birds, but we've actually pulled more birds from the uh, fields to the timber this year and uh, experienced a lot more birds working the timber than normal. I mean, it's yeah, and in the anno, you know, I'm thinking, you know, I just chased birds in fields for two days or three days or whatever it was. I was kind of ready to be in the field, and then I realized that these Indiana birds weren't going to mess with fields. Every bird that I saw or heard was in the woods, and I just couldn't get on them. It was, it was, and when they, you know, like I said, that first morning they gobbled, but after that I didn't hear much. So it was kind of like just deer hunting. You know, I set a decoy up and just kind of sat there and did some soft call and every now and then do some yelps every now and then. And I don't know if it just got hunted hard, the property I was on, because it was public land. I've never killed a public land bird. So it's kind of something that I want to check off the, the list, you know, as far as turkey hunting. And I just can't seem to get it done here in Indiana. You know, public land's always going to be tougher than uh, private land. I'm uh, definitely I'm here where I'm at. I hunt 90% private land and uh, don't deal with the pressures that public folks do. And uh, but it's, at the same time, I mean, 
you got to think those birds have probably seen had ever call through Adam throughout the spring that you could imagine. <laughs> right. Seen car horns. I mean, who knows what all's been through ten birds? So yeah, kudos for the tough hunting. Anyway. Definitely. I, I mean, I gave it a shot. That's all I can say. You know, I, I I gave it my best. I walked, like I said, about twenty miles in about a four day span. So it's not like I just sat in the same spot. I was trying to make it happen. <laughs> right, right on. Right but, uh, you know, something I usually uh, start with every week is how did you get involved in hunting? How did you get started hunting? Was it something you picked up later in life or did you start when you was a kid? I started whenever I was a kid. Uh, my dad, all his friends, my family, all major white, big whitetail hunters. Uh, we really didn't have a turkey season here. You didn't hear of turkeys here much. You know, it was a treat to hear one gobble. And uh, reintroduction and restock in 1994 93 i think was our first turkey season here in my county in east tennessee johnson county um not a lot of birds killed i hunted that year hunted for four years before i ever heard my first gobble uh what can i say uh, it was over heard that first one and it was on um, a few years later i was introduced to call making and it's i've never stopped it's it's become my passion uh my wife is involved with me uh, she's not available right now but me and her both we build turkey calls together uh she turkey hunts with me that's awesome we deer hunt uh my oldest son's getting into deer hunting finally he's nine and uh we just uh it's part of our lives i mean it's yeah i i completely understand you know you know, you guys are making calls for people and making, I'm sure, incredible connections. I, I think you mentioned about having some some guys that are some pro staff that you got going there. That's pretty cool. How how does that kind of work out? I mean, I never, you know, never really hear that side of it. But being having your own call company, uh, do you sponsor some guys or how does that work? Well, you know, the way it really uh, wouldn't call it sponsor. A group of guys that I've just become really close with, really good friends. They're, I mean, pretty much like family to me. Mm -hmm. They believe in the products we make. So, when in return, you know, they promote our products, they use our products, and, uh, you know, they receive free product, free perks. And, it, you know, they come hunt with me quite a bit, several of them. Uh, always enjoy the time hunting. But, yeah, I mean, it's a uh, win-win for everybody. You meet so many people. I mean, I've made so many connections. Yeah. Since I've started making calls, I mean, just throughout the industry uh, from Florida, I mean, it's people that I looked up to as a kid now that I get to talk to on a regular basis. It's uh, It's been an adventure and uh, a blessed journey, that's for sure. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, you're talking about me just, you know, meeting people and having that – that connection we actually met through someone sort of uh hunter mueller that i had on a couple times uh we had we he had talked about you and your calls and then after we stopped hitting record me and him talked for another half hour 45 minutes and he highly recommended me looking into your stuff and i bought the the tennessee trio and uh those are the calls that i i really used in michigan and <laughs> when uh whenever i get that 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 footage put up on youtube i will definitely tag you and, and stuff because you're going to hear me on it quite a bit i had those birds fired up on i don't remember, remember which one i was using i think it was the bat wing in that whole trio we got and a hot was, bat wing man i'll tell you folks whew, that, that thing had that hen that hen was pissed that hen was ready to come in just and, and and it's crazy you'll see it on the video these four times they weren't just like slowly making their way when that hen she booked it across this field she was ready to fight me or whatever she was ready to do and they and, and they weren't slow about it i mean they were strutting but they had a good walk behind them and they were fired up that's that's what i like to hear right there man oh yeah any that's i think that's what really drives my passion in this is uh just like what you said hearing other folks talk about what they can do what happens in the stories man i mean how can you get tired of something like that and I'm not even saying that I'm uh, I'm that great. Of, I mean, I'm 
I probably got better at the at the um, the diaphragms at a younger age, but I can't. I wouldn't say that I, I can do just a million different sounds on it, but I I can do what needs done. You know, purr and cluck and uh, yelp and all that stuff. I can do that, and whatever I was doing, it was it was working out for me, except for that deer screwing it up. But uh, incredible calls, man! I, I really enjoyed using them all season, and I'm gonna continue to order more from you, man. Hey, I appreciate that, Brett, and uh, you know my calls. They're available. Uh, we have a website. Um, we just opened that last year. We was pretty much social media and just word of mouth before that. And mm-hmm. We wanted to uh, kind of, you know, get the word on out there, get these calls in other folks' hands, uh, as many people as we could reach because, you know, we're, we're not charging an arm and a leg. Right. We're uh, every call. I stretch everyone. I put every cut in the call. My wife tapes everyone. Cuts every piece of tape. I mean, you get consistency. You get the same cut, the same stretch from the same person in every call. Yeah, that's you know, awesome. Man. If you order a bat wing this year, I'm going to be making it. If you order a bat wing next year, you, you're going to have me making it. I mean, it, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> consistency. I mean, nothing's going to change. Yeah, and and you're and you're putting everything you got into making them, which makes it it puts it even more value. I feel like on the call because you you're going to want it to sound exactly what it is. If, if you were using it, you know, you'd put that same touch on it, which is what I like in, in having custom calls. Yes, sir. We, uh, I build everyone like I'm going to keep it and use it myself. Uh, mouth call, pot call, duck call, deer call. Just everyone's made like it's going to stay right here with me and, uh, going to be used the next day. That's awesome, man. So what, what got you, uh, into the calls and how did you just go about starting your, your company? Um, well, it started out back in uh, the late 90s. My parents bought me a mad call maker kit. It was a little small plastic box kit that come with some frames and latex and tape. You know, you stretched your calls. Uh, I went through that thing like crazy, bought I don't know how many refills and just kind of got addicted. Mm-hmm. Killed my first bird with a call I made in 2001. A few years later, I was introduced to a man named Thad Bright. He makes uh, Feather Ridge presses. It's the standard press. I mean, it's the best of the best. Got involved with him, got a couple of presses, a couple of cutters. And then my wife and I decided it was, you know, time to get the word out there instead of just making a few here and there. Mm-hmm. We wanted to make a go of it and, and uh we dreamed up Appalachian Custom Calls in 2014, I think. That's awesome. What made you come up with how – how did you come up with the name? Oh, man, I really uh, – really hard to describe. We was uh, both working as a residential – at a residential treatment facility for children. Mm-hmm. Uh, the name of it was uh, Mountain Youth Academy, and we was working the night shift. Our patients were in bed. We was on watch. And I love to draw. I was just sitting drawing mountains. And I wrote something about the Appalachian Mountains under it, and it hit me. Appalachian. We're right at the crossroads of the Smokies and the Blue Ridge in the heart of the Appalachians. So Appalachian Custom Calls. That's awesome, man. Born right there. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool story, man. I, I dig it, man. Uh, what about just designing the calls? Is it something that you really don't have to mess with too much? I mean, just kind of play around with it. Like, what, like, what got you into like cutting the reeds certain ways or or whatever? What, how did you get into that part? Just you know, tinkering with it. There's standard cuts that uh, most every right. cut produces, you know, and everybody does those cuts. And then, you know, as a call maker, I think every other call maker can agree. You start playing around with other cuts just to see what works, see what fits your mouth, and. Uh, you know, for myself, I use a little bit of an altered cut. It's not quite a bat wing. I can't really, I'm not really going to show much because I've not see. released this call yet. Right. It's not a ghost cut. It's not a bat wing, but it's somewhere in between a ghost cut and a bat wing. Mm-hmm. Um, just uh, started using it this past year. Really, really got a great sound to it. But you can start playing with what works. And whenever you do that, you know, you can find things and, uh, start producing them once you get a consistency with it like there's where my staff comes in again 
uh, we come up with a new cut or something, I'll send it out and we'll develop it, use it, give feedback for a couple of years until we get it to the point where we want it and feel like it can be released to the public. Yeah, that's awesome, man. What about, um, you know, you talked about hunting mostly uh, private land in, in Tennessee. Talk a little bit about the opportunities hunting in Tennessee, like, you know, private versus public. How's the public land? Uh, what kind of terrain are you hunting? That sort of thing. You know, we're, uh, where I'm out here in Tennessee, Tennessee varies, you know, in its land. You've got rolling hills down towards middle Tennessee. And here in East Tennessee, you've got some pretty rugged, steep mountains. Um, we have some wide valleys. Uh, the terrain, you know, a lot of hardwoods, a lot of cornfields and cow pastures. Um, it's, uh, it's physically demanding. Definitely. You can, uh, like I said, you could, like we was talking before, you may set up on a bird and think you have him roosted and him just sell off that ridge and be what you have to walk a half a mile and he has in two wing beats and an hour head start on you. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, everything's adversity here though. Whenever it comes to hunting, I mean, you deal with the bear, obviously, and, we have uh, here in East Tennessee where I'm at, we have more private land than public, but uh, you get on down the state, there's some great public opportunities. Uh, you have the Yahanali down in middle Tennessee, the Duck River. Um, a lot of folks talk about the draw hunts of Catoosa. Uh, President's Island, really popular for the deer hunts. Um, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that name before. Really, really great looking deer out there. We have one here close home. I don't know if it's through the TWRA anymore. Their draw hunt was canceled last year due to COVID, no but kidding. it's the Holston Ammunition and Armory. You know, it's a, uh, I guess you call it a high fence maintained area. And they have certain number of hunts drawn every year. I was drew one year, fortunately, but unfortunately it was a doe only hunt. Oh man. So I was lucky enough to harvest two beautiful does, but I got to spend two days of watching so many, I mean, 130 to 180 class inch deer are just free range through this whole, you know, military compound. It was just unreal to see them like that and see deer that close with that much potential here. Yeah. Where in East Tennessee, you know, we don't really see that a lot. Definitely. Our, our, uh, drawed hunts here in Indiana, um, it's extra. So like, uh, it doesn't count towards your state limit for whatever tag that is that you bought. So like I could kill a buck on a, uh, a military hunt or a state park hunt and it doesn't count against my, my, my one only for the state. So I could end up killing multiple bucks throughout just one year. Right. That's awesome. It is awesome. I got pretty close. Uh, uh, two years ago, I think I did a uh, state park hunt, bow hunting, and uh, they want you to shoot everything. It's a deer reduction hunt, so if they find out that you've passed on anything, it's they're not very happy that you won't be back. So I shot the first thing I could, which was a doe. She wasn't very big, but just to to do it in um, Fort Harrison State Park was kind of badass because it's got some rolling hills, but it's like the ultimate deer hunting woods, but it's almost like downtown Indianapolis, if that makes any sense. Oh, like it's cool. inner city, but it was yeah. bow only. So it was pretty cool. You could, I mean, you, we could, we drove right up to the parking lot and then went up this big ridge or whatever, but we saw a ton of deer both days. We saw probably close to 50, 60 deer. Wow. You know, <laughs> yeah. you see a lot on YouTube and stuff about urban bow hunting uh, these days. Yeah. Where, you know, there's some really big deer being taken here in the inner cities and the suburbs absolutely I, I, there's a few that i watch on youtube they kill some absolute giants you know in the suburbs you're talking almost 200 inch deer yeah i mean <laughs> hard to believe living right there downtown i mean i know it and it's it's crazy because there's like a, a, a kind of a main river that runs through there so it's all like river bottom and then some of it's grown up some of it's hardwoods it's pretty gnarly stuff for for it's like the ultimate deer location except for you're kind of in the city <laughs> wow that's that's unreal so, yeah so you talk about hunting with your your buddies and stuff uh tell me tell me kind of tell me what that means you hunt with your buddies calling for them and stuff well i mean like tomorrow i'm hunting with my best friend uh 
he was there when I killed my first turkey. He did the calling for me then. And he sort of went on the duck hunting route, got into duck hunting a lot more, and got away from turkey hunting. Now he's got back into it. We've shared a few hunts together over the last several years. Uh, caught him in a great bird two years ago. We got a bird that's absolutely hot by itself tomorrow. We're going to go see if we can get this one on film. But awesome. I mean, it's it's everything to me to hunt with them. That's that's what it's all about. It's passing it on and sh- just sharing your love of the outdoors and the passion of hunting with uh, with others. I mean, oh definitely a fellowship in that time and giving back. I mean, really letting others see you know the outdoors and the love of the outdoors in everything you do and uh, spending time with them. You know, making memories that that's going to last longer than any trophy on the wall will. Absolutely. It's, it's so wild how just like being in the outdoors can, you know, you know, bring you guys closer and stuff. Like I went to, uh, like I was telling you, I went to Michigan first time ever meeting the guys from mid state outdoors. They invited me up to come turkey hunting. I didn't know them. They didn't know me, but boy, we did we were best friends when I left there and we had a lot of beers while I was there and had a good time, you know, and it was like, I known them guys for 30 years or something. We just clicked and had a good time and right, just making new about. friends in the outdoors. It's a blast. I love it. That's right. That's what it's all about. I mean, no matter what you're hunting, deer, bear, turkey, duck. I mean, it's all about the memories you make. Absolutely, it's man. Involved, uh, you know, that kid that, it's never got the chance to go. Someone you you know that you knew all your life. Hey, bud, come on, let's go. I mean, right. Oh, army buddy, anybody. I mean, just to get to share that and you know maybe get change their life with the outdoors. You know, give them something a little bit more to look forward to the next day. Give them that something that drive. I mean, yeah, definitely to a new passion. You know, you talked a little bit of, earlier about the youth. What kind of you guys do like a youth hunt every year? You you mentioned a, getting a bird with the with the youth this year. How'd that all pan out? Well, um, I try to take a kid every year. I've been fortunate. I took my son. He don't. He's not really hit the turkey hunting bug yet. Too he'll much. get there. He'll get there. <laughs> he'll get there. He hit his, <laughs> his first two years ago, and he's like, I mean, really great bird. He's like, well, you know, I'm I'm good. I'll kill one. <laughs> so now any. Pretty much any kid that asks, uh, as long as you got a license, I'll take you. And this year, a good friend of mine asked me, he said, you know, we got some birds here in our place. Would you mind taking my son? I, was, I don't mind at all. We get up and it's 28 degrees, wind blowing 15 miles an hour and snow blowing, I think. Man, this kid's first turkey hunt. This is going to get rough. <laughs> Real quick, dude. I don't know if he's going to fit. I don't know if he's going to get addicted or not. And we was blessed let's just say this we set up 75 yards from the roost <laughs> unknowing this bird hammers i hit the red slate he hammers again he's off roost i give a couple of purrs and here he comes he rounds the hill thank goodness 20 minutes before after daylight we're back home at the basement back in the heat yeah not even time for harris to get cold and this young man is all about it now. Oh, that's awesome, though. And that's, uh, that's I, I guess you could really say that's what drives me. It's just seeing that and knowing, you know, that young man is hooked for life now. Oh, absolutely, man. I, I, I've i tried with the, the uh, my buddy Adam. I call him on the show, the neighbor. Uh, we, we've taken his boys turkey hunting the last couple of years and uh, haven't, haven't had a success yet, but... Uh, I had one at probably 20 yards or so the first time I took him down to Kentucky and uh, he didn't have his gun up and get his gun ready and the, the Jake spotted him and oh, no. started doing his thing and took off running. I was like, oh man, we got so close. But uh, he was fired up after that. He's like, I, I see now that I have to get my gun ready before they come in. I said, I told you that. that's why I gave you that pat. <laughs> He's ready to go now. Oh yeah. He'd be, he'd be hook, line and sinker. But that dude, that kid is a, a deer hunting machine. He probably, I mean, I spend a lot of time in a stand in the fall and that kid probably puts in more hours than I do, <laughs> which you is know, awesome. That's where I started out was in the deer woods. Uh, deer hunt for years that was the only thing really we had here deer squirrel and rabbit i mean if you wanted to hunt and 
you know, teenager, everybody coon hunted. And I wish now you could see more of the youth coon hunting again. I mean, that's something we haven't touched on yet is predators. Right. And, I, you know, everybody talks about predators need to be trapped more, need to be trapped more. I agree, but we need to see more coon hunters in the woods. Definitely. I, I mean, mean when, when I was in high school – uh, we ran trap lines before school. I mean, uh, yeah. we did that sort of thing, and it was a lot of fun doing that back then. I can remember taking him to the fur buyer and all that sort of stuff and getting a few bucks here and there, which back then you probably got a lot more. But I remember hearing my grandpa talk about it in the 80s, 70s and 80s. He said that they made an absolute killing coon yeah, hunting back in the living. day. Back in the day, you can make a living just off trapping. Yeah. Off you know, for yeah. us, it was all about getting out at night. You know, teenage boys get to go stout half the night and chase yeah. dogs and slip a beer here and there. But <laughs> right. still, yeah, you know, the, the joy of coon hunting and knowing that we was helping protect nests and protect the species we love to hunt. I mean, love to see more of it and wished I could uh, help introduce, reintroduce coon hunting, you know, more than what I can. But it's just important that we keep trapping and uh, keep those hunters keep those coon hunters give them permission you know yeah. a lot of folks are worried about them affecting their deer here in this area i walk beside a deer with a coon light i mean less than 30 yards and dog go right by them deer never get up right i mean it's uh it could be a double-edged sword i guess you would say but I like to see a lot more folks out there do what they can to take these predators out uh i know we try to run a trap line every year and do what we can we have some neighbors who love to get out and call them shoot coyotes, uh, <clears throat> anything we can do, you know, to sort of cut down a number of these varmints. Yeah, we, we try to do our fair share on coyotes, too. We never really have a whole lot of success, but there are some guys that live uh, around me. Um, you know, th their, their coyote season is like our turkey and deer season, you know, like it's everything to them. They're out all night with you know night vision and ars and all kinds of stuff but uh kudos to them because they're putting a hurting on them i've seen some of the piles they show me pictures of but i i I've just never been any good at it i've never had been on the i've been on a couple successful hunts but it wasn't something like we went out there hit the call they came running in we shot them i was hook line and sinkered because i probably would be if i was on a hunt like that and somebody showed me how to do it the right way I'm sure I would be hook, line, and sinkered on some coyote hunting because oh, yeah. there's a ton of them around here. So, but um, they were not allowed to hunt anything at night unless it's a raccoon or anything. We can't, uh, we can't use a call like that. We can't coyote hunt at night. Oh, really? We have to have a light on or whatever here. But I know a lot of them guys. They're just standing out there in the pitch black on big trip or bipods on their guns, and it's all night vision scopes and stuff on there. I don't think they yeah. even mess with the light, but. That's for them to get busted, not me. There you go. I mean, uh, <laughs> to every man his own, kudos to them, uh, I guess you could say. Yeah. Not what, more to me. What about uh, kind of going back to the turkeys a little bit? Do you, you, you run a decoy much, or is that something you get into? Well, you know, uh, this year it's been 50-50. Uh, we've run some decoys. Um, we just actually – my best friend purchased the Higdon Feeding Motion Hen. Awesome decoy. I mean, absolutely love it. The, this first bird he killed. Uh, coaxed her right on in with it. And then we had uh, one staffer in that brought, I mean, close the distance in no time to 25 yards. We're not going to mention no names or whether he hit that bird or not. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. But, you know, I mean, we got the bird – the bird was hung up with hens and he turned this hit the remote and turned her on dude and they all hens and all seen her feeding and was just like true to her wow that's awesome. one of the best products i've seen yet i mean i, I told him i'll have one I'll that's have awesome one. if you're saying that i definitely got to check that out but um, yeah if i'm hunting the field edge i run decoys a lot timber if it's closed in you know depending on how thick here in east tennessee it gets pretty thick and yeah you know, uh, just depending on the situation and the terrain, really, whether I'm going to run a decoy or carry all that damn weight up the mountain, honestly. Right. And, and with them being in the timber like that anyway, you're trying to get them to 
be curious and look around. You probably don't want them seeing a whole lot because you want them to, you know, you want to pull them just a little bit closer. <laughs> a little bit closer. <laughs> just just a little soft bit. and sparse. And yeah. Just keep it nice. Keep it all clean and pretty. Absolutely. What about gun? You told me, kind of gave me a behind the scenes on your on your gun setup. What kind of gun you rolling with? Well, uh, the last couple of years I went with the Stevens 301 410, uh, Carlson's heavyweight choke and federal number nines and the deadly combination. My father shot last year with it was 37 yards. Absolutely stone cold a bird. And then this year, I can gladly say my father's shot's been about 14 yards. <laughs> That's so, awesome. <laughs> Not been too much of a challenge with it, but uh, really got hooked on the 410. I'm loving hunting with it. You know, the weight difference, it don't break your shoulder. I mean, I'm hooked. Uh, that's all I can say is I'm hooked on the 410. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people kind of go to that setup, and like you said, it's lightweight. You can travel a lot. You know, if you're running and gunning, running up them right. ridges and mountains, you're having a lighter gun is never a bad thing. That's right. Shorter gun, easier to maneuver. You can get away with a little more with it, too. You know, if you do have to change your setup or swing around, it's a little easier to get away with. So I'll, I'm enjoying the gun. It's I'll I'll, uh, I'll recommend it to anybody, that's for sure. What about blinds? Are you, are you a blind guy or no? Um... Maybe depends, the rain <laughs> depends on who I'm hunting with, the setup, the situation. Uh, I haven't set in a blind this year. I use a throwdown blind, a mare step throwdown, just it's a hub system, little panel that sits in front of you. Mm-hmm. Weighs like two pounds, fits in your vest. I use it occasionally in case I need to work a pot call or anything like that. Yeah, that's it, kind of the same thing. I, I use it kind of all packs into my vest in the back but i just roll it out and it's got stakes and i can just stick it in stakes it's got like four different stakes or whatever but i kind of have it always like coming around me so you, if something was to come in the side it might break up my silhouette a little bit but exactly, exactly. apparently just... it didn't work on the deer the deer saw me <laughs> bastard uh, it's kind of funny it seems like we're during turkey season the deer want to come to you and if you're yeah. sitting there in the tree stand deer hunting the long beards are right under you, usually feeding, walking, looking around. I mean, <laughs> oh yeah, like they know. I told them, I said, I'm coming back to Michigan just to shoot that doe. That doe is done. <laughs> I'm coming back up here to get that doe. <laughs> you remember her? You will remember her? Oh, I remember that face. I got you on camera. You're on camera, girl. <laughs> there you go. Um, what about you know? I probably skipped this question, and it, it, I want to come back to it since you got what you got going on, but learning to call where where did you learn to to turkey call well i guess you could say i was self-taught self-taught uh, oh you know we bought our first mouth calls everybody did back in the day at walmart i guess you'd say oh yeah me too old back in the day hs struts primos We'd walk around with them at school try to use them nobody get a sound Finally, we, you know, we started buying videos, VHS videos. This has been that long ago. Oh, I'm with you, buddy. <laughs> and listening and learning and just watching and just practice and practice and practice. I mean, going through so many calls, never taking them out of your mouth, 24-7, having a call, having a call. And after a while, you know, you start learning to make certain sounds and it becomes natural to do it, natural to make the next sound. And I mean, it's just a process. Uh, I can't stress enough practice, 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 practice. Definitely. And then just spending more time in the turkey woods, hearing those vocalizations is only going to do a number of your, just your knowledge and knowing what sounds to make and what situations. Exactly. Exactly. You can't spend enough time in the woods listening, especially if you know where a flock is. I mean, um, for me, I have a neighbor who has tame turkeys as well. So just to be able to sit and listen to those birds, even the wild, the tame, it don't matter. Just to be able to listen, listen to their cadence, their rhythm, you know, when they make the sounds, why they make the sounds. Just trying to learn and, you know, trying to actually think like that turkey's thinking. Definitely. Do you feel like turkey hunting's becoming a, a more of a popular thing to do for outdoorsmen? Well, you know, actually I do and, especially since the COVID pandemic, you know, we've seen an increase in people outdoors and, you know, just 
with everything, we've seen an increase in sales of calls. Uh, I've seen a lot of newer hunters getting into the sport. Um, it is a growing sport. I like to see it grow more. I like to see more youth get into it. Um, I like to see it pushed more on the youth instead of video games these days. Amen yeah. to that. Amen to that. <laughs> uh, I was just kind of having a similar conversation with somebody the other day. Man, do you just remember? I can remember growing up and going I, I never was i mean to a certain point you know like we always were outside playing basketball or football or you know golfing or you know just always had the neighborhood kids uh back when i lived in town you know playing games with one another and then you know when when i did move out to the country it was the same thing just different activities you know we'd go out there and shoot our bows or shoot yeah. some guns or just be in the outdoors i feel like we, we have got to get these kids outdoors right now. Exactly. I mean, we, me and my wife just talked about that the other night, Brett. What's so funny that we was always outside of kids. Uh, I grew up with a pond right across from my house, and fishing was my passion as a kid. I mean, if I wasn't helping in the back of the field or in the hay, I was the pond. That was where I was at. Squirrel season come, I was gone. I mean, never in the house. Right. You know, we, we, eventually got a nintendo that's reserved for whenever it's too cold to go outside <laughs> right. or it's raining right until then that nintendo don't come on neither's that tv you get your butt out that door and keep your ass out there yeah and and, and I'll, I'll be turning 33 this year and i feel like my generation people my age are really what brought the video games <laughs> in i'm like man i hate to be a part of that that generation don't get me wrong I've played my fair share of video games, but um, I, I I don't want my son to be that way. I want him to be more outside and addicted to the outdoors like I am because if I can try to pass on as much knowledge as I can to him being young and just get him in the right experiences and situations as a turkey hunter, a duck hunter, a deer hunter, whatever, he's going to know how to handle it later on when I'm not around to do it for him. <laughs> That's right, and he could take those situations and take them to everyday life, how to handle everyday life situations. Absolutely, man. Uh, and, um, it gives them time to grow and reflect on their lives as well, personally and spiritually grow. Um, I know that being in the woods has helped me spiritually grow tremendously, uh, helped me grow closer to God, closer to my wife, um, closer to the outdoors itself. It's just, and yeah, I want to see my sons get the same kind of passion that I have. My youngest, uh, he is four years old. He does not know any fear, and he does have the passion. And <laughs> watch out, <laughs> God love him, my nine year old. <laughs> he is not got the passion yet, but like I said, we're working on it. We're getting there. I didn't really get that passion. <laughs> I wish I had got it at a younger age, but um, that passion really didn't hit me until about 14. And then it was game on. Everything I, everything I wanted to do in life it had to do with the outdoors. Like, it's funny, my wife and all of her friends, which her friends, her their husbands are in the same boat, but, you know, like, I base, like, my vacations around hunting. <laughs> you know, like, there's always some kind of trip or, you know, shooting bows or whatever, you know. Yeah. There's always something going on. I'm not, I used to be big into fishing. I don't fish as much as I used to. I still love it. Uh, I don't do it as much as I should, but uh, just being outside, man, I love it. Oh, yeah, me too. I mean, uh, I still love to catch a smallmouth every now and then. I don't get For sure. Like I used to did. Uh, I, now I don't even get the turkey hunt like I used to did. I spend most of my spring in the shop, actually, as much as I can, making sure everybody else's turkey season's proper, but. Anything I can do outside, I'm there. I love hiking, fishing, hunting. Um, it don't matter what it is. As long as we can get out and enjoy the creation, that's all that matters, man. That's... How many uh, How many hunts did you get to go on this year where it was a, a successful hunt for turkeys? Well, we still have a week left, and we're going in the morning, so we're not done yet. Right now, one, two, three, four, seven so far. Pretty good number. I, I like that number. Seems and one like... missed, so it should have been eight, but, you know, <laughs> names. Oh, right. yes. oh, that's awesome. I, I'm laughing because I have been that guy, and I know, like, 
the, the shit you can catch from from oh. missing a bird, which it, it makes it even worse when you already feel bad enough that you miss, then you got everybody heckling you. Hey, I had a year, Brett, where I tomahawked a uh, semi-automatic off a ridge. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I'd missed several birds already that year, and I emptied everything I had, all three. Boom, boom, boom. Man, that bird was gone, and I just, it hit me wrong, and me and the gun parted ways that day. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I want to dive into a little bit of talking um, to whitetails with you. You said that yeah. you grew up deer hunting and all that stuff. I want to pick your brain a little bit on how, how you uh, chase these whitetails. Are you are you a big bow hunter, or is it mostly just gun season that you get to hunt? You know, um before turkey season, uh, before turkey became my passion, archery was my passion. 3D shooting, bow hunting. Still love to bow hunt some. i uh, switched over now. I use a crossbow. Mm-hmm. Getting older, I ain't got the shoulder strength I used to have, I guess you'd say, and kind of got lazy with it. But, yeah, I, I love early, good early bow season. Yeah. Bow hunt. Uh, black powder is my number one. I'd rather black powder hunt than anything. Uh, it hits right there in our route. My dad was a big black powder hunter, and it's just always really uh, been my favorite. I'll, something about it. I don't know why, but black powder's always been my favorite. How does deer season work in uh, Tennessee? Is it mostly like one big long bow season, and then you get like two weeks to gun hunt, or is it like broke up? Actually, you got a uh, long bow season. Oh, wow. A two-week muzzleloader season, and then a long rifle season. But in between that archery and uh, muzzleloader season, you'll have a weekend of juvenile. And then at the end of the uh, last of the rifle season, you'll have a last juvenile. That's pretty um, cool. We have a we have a pretty significant season. We're allowed two bucks statewide. Uh, our state is broke up into four sections. You know, here in my zone, I think uh, I have to look at this year's regulations. I'm pretty sure it's seven does. Wow. Two bucks. Uh, Middle Tennessee. Some places where some of my staff are, like uh, Mari County, Marshall County, Hickman, they're allowed up to three does a day. Wow. It must be a pretty healthy deer population. Really good population down that way. I think they're making some changes to ours. Man, I can remember uh, certain counties, because in Indiana, your uh, bag limit for does is just based on what county that you're hunting in. But I can remember some of the counties were 10. You could shoot 10 does. And then you just saw that number dwindle down. And some of those counties that you could shoot 10 in, you can only shoot three of them. And now like three, I think it's three or four is like our highest number now, which is wild. But like I've talked on here a million times, uh, when I first started deer hunting, it wouldn't be anything to see, you know, an average of six or seven, eight deer, you know, on a slow day, you know, some days I, I, I go, I've been, I'm not gonna lie to you. I've been in certain points of, of early bow season a week, week and a half without seeing anything period. Oh man. Yeah. And talk, and, and like I said before, I spend a lot of time in a tree stand come October to the end of November. It's, I mean, I put in just as many hours in a tree stand as some people do at work. <laughs> and uh when you sit there for that many hours and you're not seeing anything that can really take a toll on you right uh, for some reason but, my phone's uh timer just cut off and somebody tried to beep in but got you're good part. sorry about you're, that nah you're good buddy it's uh it's a new thing i haven't I had one other guy use a phone when we when we recorded, and for some reason the audio was really messed up. So I'm really hoping this conversation goes smooth on the on the audio end. But I hope it does too. If not, we'll have to get out the iPad and try. I say we'll have to we'll have to record again, but because it's it's been a pretty good episode talking to you. But uh, I like to talk. <laughs> you you talked a little bit about dabbling in, in the duck calls and stuff. Have you ever really messed with a deer a deer deer call like a tube or something grunt well, tube? We, um, we launched, uh, we did 25 grunts last year just to sample out and see where they went. Uh, complete sellout, you know, praise God on that one. Thank the Lord. Uh, but really, uh, a lot of folks have liked them. Uh, we're going to come back this year. I'm going to try to do probably 40 to 50 of them, maybe more. And then we did 10 duck calls all together just to see five singles and uh, five double reads. 
Uh, really good results with that. Everybody seems to like them so far. So we got a few last pot call orders to get out right now. Once they're done, we're going to be starting to roll out the duck calls and the uh, deer calls. Is this, is the making a, a grunt tube? Is that a longer process than like making it, your turkey calls? It is. It is. It's a little more aggravation in all. Honesty. <laughs> and uh, I have to. I might have to get one of those off of you. I've used the same grunt tube since I was like thirteen or fourteen years old. Oh, uh, well. My uncle gave it to me, or my dad. One of the two gave him gave it to me, and and it's weird because I've tried to buy other uh, brands and just. To, just to check them out or whatever and yeah. it doesn't replicate that sound that i like i don't know if it's just because i like that one certain call but it's just got like this deep throaty growl to it that i like and i'm like i don't think anybody's ever uh, hopefully i never break this thing because i'll be in tears <laughs> you know for the longest time i used an extinguisher yeah. those are nice I, that um that's really? i never got that one but um I, i've watched a lot of hunting videos with that thing i've always i've I always liked it um I started out, we did a cedar to start with. We're going to go to a walnut this year and try to get just a little bit of a more deep, clicky sound. Mm -hmm. uh, do some things different with it. You know, we're going to keep it to an adjustable call where we can uh, go from a fawn to a uh, mature buck. That's so awesome. An adjustable sound tube in it. What about uh, the wood? You know, you talked about certain woods. How does the supply on that sort of thing go? Is it something that you have to deal with, like being short in supply? Or Sometimes, yes. Right now I'm dealing with that. Um, we've got, you know, a few pot collar orders and we're short supplied on wood. And finally we've got that wood in stock so we can get those out. But it, it can really be hard. Uh, the slate industry is getting kind of hard right now price of it's really went up uh, you know inflation everything's gone up yeah supply and demand yeah absolutely and there's you know i'd imagine there's especially in the spring or probably late winter everybody getting ready for you know turkey hunting and everybody's starting to, to process those calls out i'm sure it does get pretty low yeah and it, it gets hectic I mean, it gets really hectic at times uh, i bet some days are uh some days can really take its toll on you. You talk to so many people. Some days uh, you don't realize who all you talk to, and some days easy to get them confused. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> what about other states? Have you have you traveled into any other states to do any type of hunting? Uh, have as I was younger. Uh, last few years, since me and my wife met, we've really not traveled. Went to Georgia and did some hunting. Uh, we got Carolina here close. We hit, but. Getting ready to start again as our children have got older. And now it's a little bit easier for us. We're looking at Texas this coming year. Um, Fort McCabot Ranch looking to do a turkey hunt there next spring. So Florida try, will be hard in the next couple of years again. Try to get that, that grand slam under your belt. Want that grand slam and then we, uh, one day hopefully we can chase 49, you know. It'll be cool. Turn out together. Yeah, that would be awesome. That's kind of yeah. like a – uh, a retirement goal for me. I, I wouldn't say 49. I'm just going to go ahead and put the, the grand slam in, into that, in that category. Cause I don't know if I'd ever get to kill 49 different birds and, you know, one in each different state. That would definitely be very difficult. I would think. Definitely. That's definitely. a big thing though. Right now, isn't it? Them guys, all, all them guys are wanting 49, 49. That's uh that seems like the end thing to do right now. And, you know, I'd, God, you got to think, damn, what an adventure it'd be to kill a bird in every one of the lower 49. That would be awesome. I would imagine some of those states are obviously a, a hell of a lot harder than oh yeah, you got than to, others, you know. I mean, you got to think of populations in some of the states and the hunting pressure. Damn right, it's going to be harder. Absolutely. Plus, you're probably going to have to hit public land on some of those states. So you know yeah. how hard that how hard that can be. Yeah, unless you have an endless pocketbook, yeah, I'd say public lands in your future. <laughs> You're right. Well, man, I, I I appreciate you coming on here and and bullshit with me, man. I've, I've my pleasure, Brett. Had a lot of fun with this. We'll have to get you back on for sure. You know, whenever uh, maybe next turkey season, get you in talk about some of the hunts you've been on, and maybe deer season when whenever you get that grunt tube rolled out, we can have you back on talk a. Some more white tails, maybe a little more in depth, kind of like we did the turkeys today. But uh, definitely appreciate you coming on, man. Tell uh, tell everybody where they can find you and uh, your your calls there on social media. 
Okay, we're on Facebook, uh, Appalachian Custom Calls. You can find us on Instagram. I'm uh, Appalachian Callmaker. We have a business page, Appalachian Custom Calls 1. And then we have our website, uh, www.appalachiancustomcalls.net. Um, you can message my personal page, Jonathan Scholl. You know, if you want to talk about calls or whatever, I'll be more than glad to sit down and talk to you. That's awesome, man. Well, you can uh, find Blue River Bow Hunting Podcast on um, Apple, Spotify, but anywhere you can find a podcast. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can find me personally on LinkedIn, a few other places. But I appreciate everybody uh, listening to the show with uh, Jonathan. This is episode 30, starting to really get high in those numbers compared to just starting out and everything but uh i appreciate everybody listening hit us with a rate and review on there and uh, everybody have a, a good rest of your week hey i appreciate it no Brad, problem,